Awesome. Case, I am so excited to have you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. Of course. And for anybody who doesn't know who Case Kenny is, he's a writer, a podcaster, and he focuses all about mindfulness. So I felt like what better synergy for Do The Work than for us to talk about mindfulness? Because I know, at least for me, for years, I didn't really understand the correlation between like the thoughts that I have and the reality that I was living and how it could manifest and how things could happen. So I would actually love to even start kind of, how did you, how did you get into all of this? Like what's your journey with mindfulness and where you were to where you are now? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm 35 now. Um, when I was 28, 29, um, and, and I'll purpose to say, like, I never had any aspiration to be in the like self-help field or mindfulness field or do anything like this. Like, it's so funny that I do this. I joke that I share my feelings for a living. That's kind of how I describe what I do professionally. Never had an aspiration for this uh, in, in, in any sense. Um, so previous in a previous career life, I used to work in advertising and advertising sales and technology sales. When I was 28, I was, I was doing that. I was doing a sales job in Chicago. I was leading a sales team. And uh, when I turned 29, um, went through a, a breakup uh, with someone that, you know, I was dating her for a long time. I was also traveling a lot with this job out of Chicago. I was going to like St. Louis and Toledo and Columbus, just like Midwest little, little jumping flights here and there. And at that time of the breakup, I just kind of took a step back. I was like, man, it would be really unfortunate to look back on my life 10, 20, 30 years from now and realize that I hadn't challenged myself to actually pursue a path or date people that really spoke to what I wanted, not what I thought was expected of me, not how I thought I should act as a man in every area of life. So you can call it a quarter life crisis. I don't like calling it a crisis, but it was just kind of that come to Jesus moment. And I'm very type A. And I was like, man, I don't have an answer to these questions. Why do I do this? Why do I feel this way? So on and so forth. So my answer in a very meta way was to start a podcast. Um, and uh, the rest is basically history there. I start, and it's a joke now, obviously, that every you know straight white dude starts a podcast as a way to like, con connect with friends. But I did it in 2018 to connect with myself. I saw it as a, as a means to kind of vulnerably and publicly um, ask myself questions, share what I've learned for myself to do it that way. And, and basically the long and the short is uh, I did that. I realized what I was doing, which was I was practicing mindfulness, um, started to help other people. And then you fast forward like three years into doing that, I quit my job to do it full time. But basically just the story of me doing something that I needed, realizing what I was doing, mindfulness, and then just continuing to really pull on that cord of passion and interest and impact. And, you know, here we are now. Isn't it so fucking awesome how we can turn like pain into purpose and just finding, cause I'm, I kind of have a similar journey where like, I, I mean, the podcast, I started this what, four months ago? And it's mushroomed into this crazy thing where I was like, oh, wow. yeah, like for me, when I entered into this, I had my own limiting belief of like, nobody cares about what I have to say. You know, okay, so what? Yeah, I was like, yeah. you know, I was anxious for a while and I dated all the wrong guys. And, you know, you kind of go through like your own it's kind of gaslighting of myself of, you know, discrediting my yeah. own thoughts and telling myself that I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy and all of this. And so when I started the podcast and, and same with the TikTok and the Instagram, everything that just mushroomed on its own came from a true place of, of purpose and passion of like, okay, I, maybe I'm not alone. Maybe there are other people that might be experiencing the same thing that I'm experiencing. And maybe this is a really great way to be able to speak to those people. Yeah, uh, very much related. I mean, I've always had and continued to still have imposter syndrome here and there. Like, why why should people listen to me? And I think it's healthy. I think if yeah. we deluded ourselves into being like, gather around children, I'm about to speak, it would be it would be weird and we would be in, in the land of the not so healthy. So I think it's somewhat normal for that. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it really is a gift to, to do what we do. And I always, you know, it's very, uh, I think I continue to do it. I'm about to hit episode 500 because what I do helps me first and foremost. Like it is my form of therapy. I do it every single day. I have grown immensely. Yeah. I joke that I, you know, I have to go back and like reintroduce myself to people because I've changed so much through what I do and it helps other people. It's like the ultimate balance and, and, you know, gift to be able to do it. But yeah, I think we all have things that we can share in life. Like you don't, I mean, it's great to be hyper qualified and be a trained therapist or, you know, licensed psychologist and things like that. But we all, we have the most we have human experience, which I think if we can find a way to vocalize it and help other people, it's, it's always worth sharing. And I, and I've realized that because the people that I've learned most from in life are regular average people who have just been like, Hey, here's something I learned that has been so helpful. So seeing that continues to inspire me to do the same.
I'm glad you said something about imposter syndrome because sometimes you know it's like even I had a client this morning and he was like, man, I'm really struggling with imposter syndrome. I was like, cool. Okay, so it's not just me. You know, it's not just me who like when yeah. we turn on the lights and like we say stuff because it's like we are still humans behind doing all this. And there is a lot of like, like you said, I am very grateful to all the therapists out there and to all the co to everybody out there that, that, that has gone through school and has done that. But that doesn't that doesn't automatically make you able to speak to people in a different way because you're looking at it very more cognitively. Like you're looking at it from a textbook that has taught you that versus lived experience. Like at least for me, when I give anxiety tools and management, I'm like, oh no, no, no. This isn't just because I somebody told me to do this out of a book. This is because I actually had this experience. I know exactly where your mind is going. I know exactly the thoughts and the narrative that's starting to play. And here is how yep. you can effectively cut through that. So I'm really glad it's not just me, but for, do you have any advice for anybody that suffers from imposter syndrome, especially in dating, you know, like kind of doing a lot of this work and getting back out there, like any tips or advice that you have for them? Yeah. Well, I would say to, to segue nicely off of that, just to wrap that point up, I was, at, I was on a panel the other week in LA and someone just said very simply, if you've lived through something, you've learned something. So I think we all have something to share, no matter if you lived through it and it had a great outcome or a bad outcome. We've all, we've all learned through it. And to, to your question about, you know, imposter syndrome and, you know, having frustrating dating experiences and coming out the other end and just kind of feeling beat up emotionally and, you know, the drain there, you know, it's cliche to say that, you know, you know, you know, tough experiences turn to wisdom, but like, I think about the, the topic of standards and boundaries, right? Like where do these things come from in life? Where does our, our vision of what we want come from in life? Unfortunately, it doesn't come out of a vacuum, although we can, you know, think of things that we want without experience, but standards and boundaries, they come from life experiences that were the opposite of those things. Like I talk to a lot of people who are nervous about being too picky or having too high of a standard. And the way I always help them ground it is tell me about the experience that taught you to have that standard. And if you could pinpoint it and you say, my standard is I demand loyalty and honesty, for instance. Okay. That's great. Fantastic. Where did that come from? majority of the times, unfortunately, it comes from times where they dated someone who was not honest or loyal. And I say, that sucks. I've got nothing but empathy for you. But when you can prove on a linear line, experience the standard, that is what makes it unbreakable. That is what turns a lived experience into a learned truth. And when it comes to like topics of imposter syndrome, whether it's in dating or your career, like if you live through something, you can say, this is why this is where this aspiration or goal or standard comes from. You know, it doesn't necessarily diminish the doubt that you might have, but you're like an, a lawyer, like, here's the proof, here's the evidence. And here's the, the outcome. Like you can prove it to yourself, which I think gives you like more consistency than saying like, oh, you know, this and that it's like, no, this and that because of this and that. So I, I just like my whole approach to mindfulness is very observation based. It's I have lived through a, therefore I believe B. And that's much stronger than saying, I believe B is like, no, right. I've lived through a, therefore I believe B. And we all have a massive memory bank of good experiences, bad experiences, times where we, you know, uh, achieved times where we disappointed ourselves. And I think it's our job and the way that we combat imposter syndrome is to look through those memories and come up with that, that connective truth. No. And I love that. I think that's like my favorite practice that I learned in DBT therapy was like, where are the facts to back this up? Like put your thoughts on trial yeah. so that you can yeah. even, cause I, I think like what a lot of people forget is like, you are only alone with yourself. Uh, you could have me in case with you all fucking day, but we can't control what's happening in your brain. So if you are having these thoughts, it's about being really cognizant of them and being able to say, wait, I need to call myself out on my shit. And I need to be able to say, is there actually, is there real turmoil that I'm creating this entire narrative for and my nervous system is starting to get dysregulated and all of that? Or is this an yeah. inner turmoil that is now being projected onto my next partner? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's so much there to unpack. I mean, I think the, the easiest way I always try to describe it to get people to be incentivized to do what you just described, which is tough because when we're anxious or overwhelmed or feeling down on ourselves or depressed, what you just described is the most difficult thing to do in the world because it requires 100%. vulnerability and, and forward thinking and forgiveness. I always try to encourage people literally what you described to say that in life, you have facts and feelings and they're not always the same. And the only way to have the ability to compare a feeling to a fact is to have established facts and yeah. facts are to the tune of, I believe this because of this, I've sat down and said, this is non-negotiable because of these experiences. That is how, and that, that way, when you're living, dating, working, and you're hit with a feeling, a very normal, emotional human feeling, you could say, 
I feel this. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to be unhealthy, but I'm going to say, is this a fact? It's like, you ask someone to take their shoes off at the door before you let them in. There's a moment of exchange before you're like, come on in. Right. So that's it. But you have to be able to say facts and feelings. And the only way to do that is to have established some semblance of facts or some semblance of truths that you believe. And, you know, the, the ability to do that comes from lived experience and the ability to put those experiences to your point on trial. Totally. And let me ask you, when you were like, I don't know if dating now or when you were or whatever, and you're, you're kind of whatever personal life you want to share, do you feel like you had any kind of anxiety when you were dating? And like, if so, or if not, like what were boundaries that you felt were really important to set in dating just in general or with people that you work with? Because I think a lot of people that I talk to struggle with like, I don't know where to start or how do I set a boundary or what does that even mean? And I think that has so much mm -hmm. to do with mindset as well. So I would love to hear if you have any personal experience on that. Yeah. I mean, so for me, 35 dating, live with my girlfriend here in Miami, spent a, you know, had, had several long term relationships. And then also from like 29 to 33, it was single. And I wrote a book called single is your superpower. So I definitely have you know, experience on, on either end. And I'm very passionate about, about both about being single, about the, the, you know, the, the magic of, of being in a relationship. Uh, I mean, I think for me, like the things that the thing that I always struggle with, which I think is the starting point for answering your question for everyone is knowing why you're dating in the first place. I think I always struggled with that. Um, or, or the opposite, like, why are you single? Like, what is yeah. the purpose of this stage in your life? And not like pressure to be like, oh, here's the plan. Here's exactly what I'm trying to get out of it. But I just talk to so many people who struggle with standards, boundaries, dating the wrong people, putting up with these things because they haven't decided in the first place why they're dating. And you might uh, you ask people, oh, why are you dating? And you hear a lot of the like very primal answers, which aren't bad answers. You hear, oh, I don't want to be alone. I want to start a family. It's just what you do. But I, I don't think those are either introspective enough or like self-centered enough. Like I, I do think as much as a relationship, of course, is about two people. When you're first starting the date, when you're putting yourself out there, it has to be about you. It has to be. It'd be weird if you were like, I'm going out there to offer someone my amazingness. It's like, it has to be about you, about you saying, I have worked hard in life to create happiness and I'm looking for someone to amplify it. It's, it's an I statement, a me statement. And I just find that like a lot of people don't really have that. They have the lofty statements of, I want to start a family, which I think is great, of course. But if that is the outcome in mind or dating for marriage, I think is another yeah. problematic statement. Agreed. Um, I think we lose sight of everything that comes from it, which should be dating and, and, you know, standards and boundaries. So I think we really need to sit down and figure out why we're dating in the first place. That comes from a, 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 a not a, a place of fear for one, a fear of being alone or lack, right. Hoping that someone will come along and give us purpose in life. So I wrote a whole book called Signature Superpower about that idea of like, you know, what, what is the purpose of being single versus what is the purpose of being in a relationship? So that that's kind of my answer there is like really starting at the beginning of these things, like going way back to the beginning to have a strong eye answer to that and then evolving from there. Which don't worry, we're going to link the book in the show notes so that everybody can get the book because I think <laughs> it's super important whether you're single or not to be able yeah. to read it. But no, I'm so with you. It's like, what's your intention? I'm very like I was I knew when I entered into the dating world especially as somebody who had like, I'm painfully self-aware, like to the point where even my friends were like, all right, what yeah. the fuck are you going to do with all the self-awareness? And I was like, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> so it's like to the point where I'm like, I know, <laughs> I know the actions of the reactions. Like I know exactly why I'm doing everything. Yeah. And, but to your point, to the simple of like, yeah, why was I dating? And I would ask people, cause I know a lot of folks are like, oh, I hate the question. Why are you single? And I'm like, see, I think we can lean into it. I would ask people, not why are you single? I'm like, well, how did we get to where we are right now? How are we both here? What are your lived experiences? What is your past? What did your past relationship, like why did it end? And what did it teach you about yourself? Asking really fucking important questions and then leaving the dates, at least for me, like shifting the mindset in this kind of context where I would leave the date, not focused anymore on like, how do they feel about me? Or did they like me? Or did it, because I'm like, that's external shit. That is somebody else's that I'm trying to get their valid and instead I was like, how did I feel with them? Did I feel like our intentions align? And I love that you brought up the like dating for marriage thing, because I think more often than not, it's like this fear of, oh, I don't want to waste my time. And it's like, when I hear that, I'm like, sounds like you don't trust yourself or I'm dating for marriage. It's like, sounds like you're very outcome oriented but you're yeah, not allowing yeah. naturalness to happen versus, I don't know about you, but like when I started dating my now boyfriend, I was just kind of like, I remember we like, truthfully, we hooked up on the first date and I left being like, I'm never going to see this guy again. I was like, oh, please. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I'm conditioned. I was like, oh God, 
And now yeah. six months later, it's like, we're talking about moving in together at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great example of, of this. I, I, I talk a lot about that as like, oh, you know, you can't do this on the first date or this, you got to wait three to like the whole, all these ideas. It's like I, for every rule I've heard, I've have multiple proof points to say that it's just not true. So I, I love that uh, for one, but yeah, I mean, the idea of like dating for an outcome, which I think is often on an emotional level synonymous with dating for validation. It, obviously we could sit here and be like, that's bad. And everyone's going to agree because we all know it's bad, but it's like, practically why it's bad is because it, it gets you out of reality and it gets you into potential. And that's where like, I see all the problems because when you're outcome oriented, all you're focused on is the potential of where it could go. And likely that's potential that's aligned with some kind of timeline. I'm getting older, having kids, marriage, pressure from your parents and so on and so forth, which again are, are fine things. We're not bad people for feeling that. And, but I, I think about the majority of, of, of conversations I have with people where in the, there's murkiness, there's mixed feelings, there's, there's lack of communication. It comes from our focus on potential. And obviously you have to be focused on potential for a relationship to say, oh, you know, this can go somewhere. But if we're not in reality, if we're not asking ourselves like in this moment, is this good enough for me? If we, have, if we can't even define what good enough for me is in the moment, then we're just going to be blinded and myopically focused on the future. And that's where we start overlooking all kinds of things. So I think it goes back to the beginning of why am I dating me? Why me? Another question I, I like that has to be additive to an additional question we can talk about later, but is, you know, how do I want to feel? Like, yeah. I think we need to be able to define that for ourselves. Cause you'd be like, Oh, he was funny. I felt entertained. But is that your goal? Is your goal to be entertained by your partner? Yeah. I want to be understood. Okay. Well not now we're getting somewhere, but is there, is there more to it? So I, I think we need to take time. I'm a voracious journaler. I really encourage people to journal, go to therapy, whatever format allows you to be honest with yourself, to sit down and say, here's how I want to feel and why, where that comes from, what would that offer you? Um, and use that to guide your intention of dating in the first place. So you're not just swiping mindlessly, ending up in a relationship because you think it has legs, legs to what? Um, you know, I think it's a strong place of power to operate from. No, I love that. I, I couldn't agree more. Like my boyfriend will always say that. He's like, what's the objective? And it's like, cause I'll get, you know, people that will like write in or this or this. And he's like, okay, well, this could have seven different outcomes depending on like, what is it that you want? And I think sometimes when I shift that question where I'll be like, okay, cool. How do you want to feel when you're with somebody? And you'll get kind of the stare of like, oh, I guess I didn't even really think about that. Like I didn't really think about how I want to feel. It's like, you want to feel seen, heard and understood. Okay, cool. So did that person ask you questions about yourself? Did they, did they yeah. at least try to get to know you? No, they didn't ask me anything. It's like, cool. So you didn't feel very seen, did you? And then when you answered, were they just waiting for you to stop talking so that they could start talking? Cool. You didn't feel, feel heard. So you might feel about them. Oh, but they're so hot. And oh my God, they've got a great job. And, da, 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 and all those cute little like bubbly, shallow lists. It's like, but at the core meat and potatoes, then we wonder why situationships happen. It's like, because you're not really being authentic to your needs and being communicative about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, it's the timeline you just described is, is perfect. Like, that is how we should evaluate our, our dates and interactions with other people. And we also, we need to find strength to really stay rooted in that because yeah. I think what you just described, I see so often, particularly with women in that they'll be like, yeah, I want to see, be certain, you know, heard as seen and understood and, and felt in that way. But you know, and then they'll check off all these like exterior things that are, and they're like, well, maybe I'm being too needy. Maybe I'm asking for too much, or maybe eventually I'll get those substantive things. And we've kind of flip flopped our pyramid hierarchy of needs. And now we're going to the superficial thing. So I, we need to find a way to really stay rooted uh, in that. And also it's like, our past experiences are really powerful in that they give us those standards, but they, they could also be the contrary. Like I see a lot of people say, this is what I deserve because I've been offered it in the past, but like, we have to draw a strong line. Like what you've been offered isn't necessarily what you deserve. Like we, we misconstrue that all the time. That's just what someone's offering you just because it's been offered to you maybe once, twice, you know, that the bare minimum is not what you deserve. For instance, if we're going to the end of the spectrum, like we can't look to the past of call it disappointing dating experiences where we've been offered less or something that's not rooted in reciprocity as proof of what we deserve in the future. So we have to be able to delineate that and look at our experiences in both an affirming light of what you deserve and also a challenging light of this is the experience, but I actually deserve the opposite of it. And I think somewhere in the mix there is our ability to critically evaluate our relationships in the present. No, I, perfectly said. And I think there's, 
it's funny because my, um, I got, I talked to, my, I would say my clientele is like very 50, 50 split, which like, I thought I was going to have significantly more women. And I'm like, Oh no, no, there are a lot of men as well that are dealing with this stuff. I just don't think that they get, that's why I'm so stoked that you are being so open about this because I think it, it gives a sheds a light that like, yes, there are men that think this like, yes, they do exist. And just because you haven't met them yet. But I, I find it so often that like, I'll deal with somebody that's like, oh no, these are my boundaries, non-negotiables. And I'm like, okay, talk to me. What does a date look like for you? And they're like, well, before I even go on the date, I'm telling him I'm not sleeping with you and da da da. And it's like, you know what? That's actually telling somebody. It's like, that's not setting a boundary. What sets a boundary is at the end of the night when the guy walks you to the car and says, do you want to come back to my place? You say, no, thanks. That's setting a boundary. I'm like, what you're actually telling this person by being so outward of like, well, I'm not going to get hurt. It sounds, you don't trust yourself that you have to, it sounds insecure that you have to say it. What you're telling no. this guy mm -hmm. is that's what I'm used to. I'm used to a guy fucking Ooh, me over yeah. after a first date. So now I'm going to tell you what doesn't work versus I don't want to talk about what I'm not going to do. I'd rather talk about what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, for, yeah, for one, I mean, practically you're basically radiating this, this insecurity and you're, you're radiating, you know, you're carrying something from a past experience. You're, you're projecting these, these perceptions of, of, of what you're expecting. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a, you know, I, I always talk a lot about like a willingness to be hurt um, in the sense of like a willingness to put yourself in situations where your feelings might be rejected. Your energy might be not reciprocated. You might have to affirm your boundary and say, no, like we have to be willing to put ourselves in those positions with no prior judgment. I think that's a really strong place to operate from. And of course it's very tough because the more you put yourself out there, the more you're willing to love first or try first or be the first one to make a first move, the more likely you are statistically to, to experience some form of rejection, but that is where you prove it. That's where you prove it to yourself, of course. That's where you prove that a standard isn't just something that you can talk and, and post a quote on Instagram about. It's where you could actually live it. And that's what makes it real. And of course, it's tough. It's like it's much easier to text someone before and say, hey, I'm not sleeping with you than it is in the moment to be like, no, I'm not sleeping with you. It's, of course, it's two different realities. And one is awkward and one is, you know, maybe not so much. But it's like our willingness to put ourselves in situations where we stand up for ourselves and we're willing to, I, I did this whole, I wrote a whole chapter in my new book about a, a willingness to try first. Yeah. I, there's this quote on Instagram. I see it all the time. And it's so funny to me. It's, it's something to the tune of uh, whoever cares less wins. And I, I just hate it so much. Oh, I hate, I hate it that. with I every, hate that. every ounce of my soul. But it's like, every time I see it, everyone's like, yeah, it's like, I don't, I'm not, I don't, you know, I, I'm waiting for your move. I'm checking you mm -hmm. out, man. And we, we've, we've got <laughs> people who like, you know, really like that kind of advice that they, they see it as like an empowering thing. They're like, no, you make the first move. You match, you know, like I'll match your energy. And I just think that's such a passive way to like, I can't think of a more explicit example of waiting for permission in life than uh, whoever cares less wins mindset. So I'm very anti that. I'm sure you are I, as well. I, I, if um, only everyone could yeah. see my facial expressions while you were saying that. Yeah. I was like, disgust, oh, pure God, disgust. I, it's the same. <laughs> I'm not a big fan. Personally speaking, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the stuff that's mainstream, especially, which I, I was going to ask you what your favorite quote is of yours, but we're going to get to that later because I'm, I'm, I'm loving this too, because I'm, I don't love the black and whites. I don't love the sweeping statements. And I'm with you. Like when people, I have all the time, like, oh, match their energy. And I'm like, why would you water yourself Ugh. down to do something? I'm with you in the sense of if somebody doesn't reach out to me, like if it's not reciprocal, I'm like, if I'm, yeah, if I'm in a yeah. tennis match and I'm throwing 30 balls at your fucking head for you to finally send one back, you're right. I should just walk away. Yes. But why would I then yes. match your energy? Because then I'm now doing myself a disservice and I'm self abandoning my wants and needs to now match where you are, which is baby, that's a low vibration for me. Yeah. Yeah. Not fucking yeah. With and that. Of course, I'm never, I'm not advocating for people to, to, you know, yeah. be, you know, to, to hurt themselves in the process of doing this and disrespect themselves. It's a matter of be willing to try first, see what's 100%. received. If you want to try again, so be it. But two, three times you're, you're done. You're done. Um, but that's you being active. That's you driving your yeah. wants and needs in life. It's not sitting back and waiting in the hope someone shows you interest or shows you direction or, you know, they finally state their in intent you ask it, you speak it, you do all these things. Like I talk a lot about like, how can we break free of this aversion we have to being rejected, which yes. is all what we're talking about here is like, 
you know, you could sit around all day and be like, oh, well, you deserve clarity and from clarity comes good. Yeah, of course. But it's like, when I think about mindfulness, I kind of think about like brute force mindfulness. Like mindfulness isn't always like, like feelings and, and sensitive. It's about incentivizing yourself to find honesty, compassion, introspection. And the thing that I always come back to is like a little mantra. It's like in instances where there's a lack of communication, there's some kind of ambiguity, mixed signals, we're confused. And we don't want to speak up because we're afraid of being hurt or rejected. It's like, how do we incentivize ourselves to do it? I always come back to the thing of just like, when you speak up, you either get what you want or you get what you need. Both are always going to serve you. Get what you want, get what you need. Get what you want, you have a conversation. They're, they're on the same page. You have a conversation about it, you're good. Get what you need, you finally have a conversation. You realize they're not into it and you, you hit the road. You're out of there. But either way, it's get what you want, get what you need. So like, I literally say that to myself when I'm, don't want to have a conversation with someone or it's awkward or potentially hurtful. I'm like, case, get what you want, get what you need, get what you want, get what you need. Cause both serve you. One hurts your feelings, but either way, you're not in this ambiguous gray zone of life. And I find that to be just a, a, you know, catalyst for action and for speaking that for so many people, we just delay it. We delay it for so long until a, until a breaking point, And then we're just like emotional blah, and we finally do it which I, I wish people would just save themselves <laughs> some of that anguish by in their pocket, get what I want, get what I need, get what I want, get what I need. Not compulsively, but just <laughs> in a healthy, honest way, right? Yeah. yeah, you're like, I'm not trying to create any neuroses here. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, it's like, yeah. that's kind of how I feel about like, I'm a big advocate of like, reveal, like, okay, how many times you'll get people that are like, oh, when should I ask somebody if they want to be in a relationship with me? And I'm like, I'm sorry, right. why are you asking somebody permission for what it is Crazy. that you want? If you want Crazy. something, you go and say to somebody, hey, I like you. I only want to date you. I don't want to be any with anybody else. And it's like, oh, well, yeah. no, then I'm going to be too much. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, too much to whom exactly? To the person that yeah. can't receive that, who is going to now, you know, you start to feel down on yourself because of their inability to receive honesty, open and communication. Because I wish people understood being in a relationship is a lot more than just having some fun dates and going around and having good sex. Being in a relationship is having really tough fucking conversations that are uncomfortable that lead you to growth. But that at the end of it, you're like, wow, I feel closer to my partner now that we said this. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing is like, the right partner wants you to be open and real and raw. And I know that's cliche and people are like, that's a pipe dream. But, but seriously, think about it. Like it's the true. right person wants to give you what you want because they want to see you happy because yep. you being happy makes them happy. Like that's the right person. And like, I have conversations all the time where it's like, well, I don't want to voice my needs because I'll be too needy or this or that or the other. And it's like the right person doesn't want to have to guess how to love you. They want you to tell them what helps them the most. And so they can give it to you. Like, uh, like uh, people, a lot of time to talk, they're like, well, it's not romantic to like say what I want in bed, for instance, or say like, this is my love language. Like it takes the romance out of it. I hear people saying no offense to those people. I think that's immature. I don't think yeah. that's to your point. I, love is that's not what love love. The, what's more romantic than you telling your partner what you want, what feels good to you and them giving it to you. It's, it's the most romantic thing in the world because it, it, it just is. Uh, you know, I'm with so you. I think we, I, yeah, it just is. I think we just need to get over our aversion to, you know, hoping that someone will know exactly what we want and need and can read our minds. Like, that's a misplaced assumption, of course. Yeah, I think with the right person, they're going to have a, 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 an emotional connection to you where they, they have a, a closer a connection to what you need and what you want. But no one truly knows what you need and what you want at the scale that you need it how often you need it, what words that you like to hear, whatever it may be. So I, I really am on board with that idea of just like being as truthful as possible because the right person will want that. And if they react to it and they judge you and they say that's too much, well, it hurts. But now you have the, the most critical proof point in your life that they're probably not the right person for you based on their reaction. So get what you want, get what you need. 100%. I love that. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I get that too, where I'll get people that are I'm like, why don't you express, you know, sharing? Well, he should just know. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now your partners Crazy. are also fucking mind readers. I had no idea, Crazy. no yeah. clue. But that's also, I mean, I'll say like one of my least favorite sayings kind of on the planet is if he wanted to, he would. And I was like, yeah. I, it's so discrediting. It's also so, it lacks so much compassion and empathy because it's like, okay, cool. So if I came to you and said, well, if you didn't want to be anxious, you wouldn't. Oh, you would call me a fucking asshole. You would tell me to go yeah. to hell in a handbasket and how insensitive yeah. am I? But yet, because somebody 
maybe doesn't have the bandwidth or doesn't whatever. Now, all of a sudden, we have to use these black and white statements to now generalize everybody and fit them all in a mold so that what? If he wanted to, he would. So that, that means that I'm not good enough for somebody to want me. Psychologically, this yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're very much on the same page here with our mindsets. Yeah, it's we like labels. We like... Yeah. Uh, you know, victim and hero. We, we like that kind of stuff because it simplifies life, but life isn't that simple. And I think lack of empathy, not only does it not serve a partner, but I think lack of empathy is what leads us to overthink. Absolutely. Yes. Like I talked to a lot of, a lot of women in particular, they're like, well, uh, you know, he hasn't texted me in a day or, you know, he didn't try to make a move on me. Like he, he must be uh, either a fuck boy or he must not like me or he must be playing with me so on and so forth and my reaction is well maybe i'm sure yeah, certainly it's yeah. always a possibility or possibility let's throw some ideas out here maybe this guy for instance hasn't texted you because he went on a date a year ago with a woman texted her right after hey it was amazing hanging out with you and she texted him back was like dude you freaking nerd like don't ever talk to me again like why like no not at all and that stayed with him he's a man yeah. He's masculine, but that hurt his feelings. Or maybe he didn't make a move on you, for instance, because he was trying to be overly respectful, or maybe he was shamed in the past for something. Who knows where these things come from? But empathy will say, okay, well, there's two possibilities. There's the the hurtful, I'm the victim here one, or mm -hmm. there's the, let's just have a little bit of patience here. We're not going to overlook things that we say might be red flags, but we're going to balance empathy with with observation and meet in the middle somewhere before we jump to these conclusions. Which I mean, and even the red flag things, it's like, so many, oh, that's a red flag. I'm like, I'm sorry, wh um, what's red flag about that? Everything's it's a like, red flag. <laughs> everything's a red flag. It's like, and what that really kind of tells me is it's like, again, I think a lot of people aren't really understanding, like you are the cent you are the main character of your own movie and everybody else is an extra vice versa. So it's like, I am just an extra and like, like as much as I would love to think more of myself, I know case that you have a full fucking robust life and I am just another extra that's entering and exiting stage left at any point. And it would be ridiculous of me to think that I would have so much control over somebody else's life that one little action is all of a sudden monumental. And I think that's where that yeah. compassion comes into understanding, like everybody is fighting their own battles. And I remember my therapist literally changed everything for me when she said, I want you to date and just even interact with people as if you see the hurt, wounded child within them, because essentially that's how everybody's operating. Yeah. And it changed yeah. everything. And instead of everybody, instead of every guy, and this kind of comes with mindset too, instead of after every date being like another fuck boy, what an asshole, fuck this oh, guy, man. everything oh. being that it's, I don't know, maybe that guy just wasn't picking up what you're putting down. Maybe that guy, like, let's say you and I were on a date right now and we left and you were like, hey, it was so great to meet you, but like, no thanks, I didn't feel a connection. I wouldn't go right to like, oh, it's because I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy. Fuck that guy. It's like, I don't know, maybe maybe he doesn't <laughs> like, maybe he doesn't like um, uh, how much I curse. You know what I mean? It's like, that doesn't mean yeah, there's anything wrong yeah. with me. Yeah. Oh, it's such a refreshing point to hear. I went off on that on my podcast the other day because I spend a lot of time on social media for the uh, sake of learning and observing, but it's yeah. like, it's become internalized at this point for me. It's like a lot of people and a lot of women in particular, and I keep referencing women, not in a bad way, just because most of my audience is women. So most of the feedback I get is from women is Same. a lot of women are so quick to say, Oh, narcissist, narcissist, uh, toxic, narcissist. It's like maybe, maybe. And first of all, we got to reevaluate what that word means, but maybe, or maybe you didn't have the compatibility or maybe sure. He didn't handle the breakup that well. It doesn't mean he's a, a clinical narcissist. Nah. It doesn't mean it was toxic necessarily. It just wasn't reciprocated and we're moving on this idea of wanting cut and dry victim labels. Again, I, I would never try to de-victimize someone and I would never try to, you know, say your experience isn't valid. Of course it is. But I think a lot of times we do that to distract ourselves from uh, holding ourselves accountable of yeah. what we put up with the, the person we were that allowed that to happen for one, but two to also do the work that says, okay, here's what I've learned and I'm moving on. Here's the why behind that, as opposed to, oh, narcissist, that was why narcissist, that was why it's like, let's, let's look at the actual behaviors. Let's get a little bit more specific. And then again, focus on us instead of, instead of them. But we're very quick to toss around terms like that. Um, you know, cause it's easy. Uh, oh, to do that <laughs> yeah it's it's like and it's, it's i mean i i actually get i used to get really offended because like my father is very textbook narcissist like down to the t and i my ex was one and so when people are oh he's a narcissist i would get 
almost annoyed where I'm like, you don't know what that really means. And you don't know how discrediting no. that is to people. And the problem, it's the same thing case with people being like, I, I, I've had the, the ghosting thing. I had to make a fucking, I worked with Yahoo recently on creating content for them of what is ghosting? Because I was like, I don't think you guys understand that the mindset you're in is actually fucking you. Because no, ghosting isn't, you didn't have, just because you had one date with somebody and they didn't want to contact you ever, that doesn't mean that they ghosted you. That person just didn't want to yeah. see you again. And so I'll get girls yeah. that are like, this guy ghosted me eight times. And I'm like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Well, he just didn't answer for two days. I'm like, oh my God, this is why mindset is so important in dating. Because when you're entering in with all of this fakakta, you know, all of this murky water, you're not actually able to see <laughs> clearly. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great point. Yeah. The ghost, the ghost and comedy. I mean, I think for me, like, I think a lot about rushing. I think a lot of what we're describing here comes from rushing. I mean, we, we have these preconceived timelines as pressure to reach certain points. And when they're not reached, we start tossing out labels. We, t we start saying, oh, it's because, you know, they're not serious. And it's like, you know, I think a lot about like the, the love that we want in quotes versus the love that we deserve. And I think mm -hmm. the love that we deserve is slow. Yeah. It certainly isn't dragged out. It's not uh, complacent, but it's slow because I, you, you know, I, you compare that to things like love bombing, right? Or like coming on too strong. It's like, again, back to the idea of the right person will want you to tell them what they want. The right person also wants to know that you're right for them. They're not yes. going to come out on date two and say, I love you. They're not going to love bomb you in an attempt to get you to love them because they don't even know you. Yeah. A healthy person is going to be a little skeptical in the same way that you should approach them with saying, what are you doing for me? They should have the same for you. So that's why it's got to be a little slow. It's got to be a little unrushed, not because they're fucking with you, not because they're not serious, but because they should have the same mentality that you have, which is let's see if actions and, and words align. Let's, let's see how the vibe is past the first date or second date. I, I've written chapters and episodes on the idea that you know the beginning stages of a relationship aren't real yeah um because i think you need conflict and you need drama to really understand someone and i'm not saying like you know you're going to concoct up some drama but that's the only way to get the true essence of someone and you're not going to get that on date one or day two that's why you need time and you can't rush it and the right person will be on the same page because they want to make sure you're right for them in the same way you want to make sure you're right for them so it's, uh, yeah, I think the idea of time is is a is a, a you know slippery one certainly. Yeah, I had a video where I talked about like going slow. Like, what does it mean to go slow in a relationship? And I was like, yeah. going slow isn't an excuse for bad behavior. It doesn't mean that you can just like see each other once every month and it's a casual thing. It's like, no, 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 that's just bullshit. That's somebody fucking with you. Going slow. I'm like, my boyfriend and I are still going slow in the sense where we're not trying to rush and expedite stages of a yeah. relationship. Why would we start talking about marriage? It's only been six months. Where are we going? Neither one of us are in any rush to get there. And I remember I had one girl and she was like, that's bullshit. A man will move mountains for you. And I was like, but what does that have anything to do with the expedition of time? And it's because again, it's like, I hate to break it to all my anxious that are listening. Anxious are also avoidant because they are avoiding the abandonment wound. They are avo avoiding mm -hmm. being alone and being so it's okay, let's just get to it so that I cannot feel abandoned when it's like, on the contrary, that's how you blink your eyes and three years later go, how the fuck did I get into this? Because you didn't see the forest for the trees. You were standing so close to the stump that you wanted it to create this entire vision. And when you finally went macro instead of so micro on looking at stupid behavior, like does he text me 10 times a day versus is this guy intentional showing up, asking me questions and trying to get to know me further – that's where that narrative starts to come into play. And it's like, if we can start to really start to chip away, and that's why I'm a big proponent of like, you don't need to text every day when you're dating. I think that is completely yeah. absurd. And I think it fucks with your mind. Yeah. Then it's like, yeah. if we can start to show ourselves a little bit of grace and compassion of this guy's not necessarily pulling the wool over your eyes just because he didn't text you for two days. Maybe he has a fucking life and you haven't earned a place in it yet. Yeah, I love that. I think, you know, the thing that I come back to is, um, you know, we talked about like knowing how you want to feel. I think that like, and I love your thoughts on this too, because like, here's where we come into the balance of like needing to hold ourselves accountable on both ends. It's like, you know, this idea of like saying, do I feel in love? I think yeah. it's, it can be a misleading question to ask yourself because there's going to be times where you don't feel in love, of course. And if, if that's your litmus test for the health relationship, you're going to start massively questioning yourself. So how do we find a balance there? So I always talk about, you know, love of course is a feeling of course it is but more than a feeling it's a series of choices it's a series yeah. of behaviors that that are exhibited by this person that we need to look to you know someone who loves you is going to do the difficult things they are going to have the difficult conversations they're going to you know ha do all these things and those should make you feel a certain way but if we're always looking through the lens of in this moment do i feel in love 
I think we're setting ourselves up for some overthinking for one, uh, a lot of comparison for two. I mean, if we're comparing what in love looks like to the internet, we'll, we'll never have love that's good enough for us. <laughs> never. There'll, always, there'll always be a version of it that's different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, this idea of balancing love as a feeling and love as a choice somewhere in there. Is the, no, is I, the answer. And I like that a lot. Cause I, I sometimes don't think about even my boyfriend, like we say, I love you. And it's like, so there are moments where I'm like, I don't love you right now. You know, it's like, I'm like, I'm not into it. And it's like, it had nothing to do with anything besides, I don't know, maybe he just, we just that day we weren't feeling as connected. Maybe he woke up and he didn't get a lot of sleep. So he was being a little shorter with me. And it's like, that doesn't mean I still don't, I'm not in love with him. And I would never make a heart, a rash decision on that. It's like, then, like you said, though, you start to look at, it's like, oh, well, the reason I love this person isn't because they buy me stuff or because they are taking me out on dates or it's like, I love them because they're supportive of me. When I'm in a low moment, they step up for me or the choices that they make, make me feel supported and loved by them that they they put me as a priority and i think being able to differentiate between the two is going to be so important and i'm i just think this episode has so much in, incredible feedback for people especially hearing it from a male who is especially somebody who's like more evolved has done a lot of work on themselves and has a different mindset i'm just so excited for the audience to hear you also have your thoughts on on this because i think it could help people maybe snap out of it they hear me say it but hearing somebody like you say it is also equally as impactful because hey i didn't make all this up <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, I, I appreciate that yeah i mean yeah i mean again like i you know i'm just I'm on the same level as a lot of people are learning the, these different things, the hard way or the easy way, or, you know, through close observation or close experience, whatever it may be. But I think, you know, we all have the capacity to be real with ourselves, to be honest with ourselves. And I think that's the most difficult thing, like in tune with what we're talking about, or like putting yourself in situations where you're potential, you're potentially hurt or rejected. It's the same with yourself. Like we run from a lot of the things that we don't want to look at. Like I used to really laugh at the idea of, um, you know, we're all victims of victims. I'm like, what a, what a silly thing to say. Like, I'm a grown ass man. Like, what does that mean? Like when, sorry, when I was eight, like I, I felt lonely and I've carried that with me my whole life. For, for example, it's like, I, I think we're remiss to not find compassion in our ability to go back as far as we can to find mm -hmm. a source of some of these things that we feel and then in the present to not get down on ourselves and feel like we're broken for having anxious thoughts or people like you know i i, I talk to guys and now on the flip side i have a lot of tough talk with guys and the guy's like oh I, I just can't settle down man i don't i don't know if i can i'm like that's such a bullshit thing you're just <laughs> like you're you haven't like what a, what a, you know, you want to talk about like not being in the driver's seat of your life. Like what a throwaway answer. Oh, I don't know, man. I just don't think I'm the guy for that. It's like, what the heck does that mean? Like you, you have zero introspection here for that. And certainly there are maybe some, you know, reasons for that clinical or something going on. Sure. But like, a lack of introspection is going to lead to a lot, a, a lifetime of confusion. And, but we're all fully capable of, of doing these things, whether it's in a form of journaling therapy, any, any form of mindfulness that gets you in a headspace of being vulnerable, even if it might be hurtful or, or awkward or frustrating or whatever, you know, it gives you, I think is always going to be immensely valuable. I fucking love that. I love that. Okay. So I want to end on a question that I've been saving to ask that I had asked you in the beginning and we didn't get to, what is your favorite quote and why, what is your favorite quote that oh. you have written on a post-it or on something on a cup? <sighs> Cause I know you have like, you see it everywhere. What resonates? I don't know. I, I honestly, the, the one that I like the most, cause it comes from my own experience that I referenced earlier, I wrote one that just said, I've changed so much over the past couple of years that I might have to reintroduce myself to people. Yeah. I know that's not a particular banger, but I like it because it speaks to the power of mindfulness, which yeah. is the ability to literally change your essence, your entire inner life as many times as you need in life. Like I think a lot of times we're, we're afraid to evolve in particular, we're afraid to start over. Like that's yeah. a big topic that I'm really passionate about this idea of starting over. I think we've, we've misinterpreted it the very much so in that we think that starting over means you failed so bad that you need to start over at zero, that you've messed up so bad that starting over means you're getting further from what you deserve. And I think it's the opposite. I think starting over means intrinsically by definition, you're getting closer to what you deserve because you're no longer accepting this thing that you've decided is not what you deserve and you're moving away from it. You're moving closer to what you deserve. And to the beginning of our conversation, anytime you start over, it's cliche, but you're never starting from scratch. You're always starting from experience. And through the way that I look at mindfulness, you can prove it to yourself. I've, I've always like tried to like gamify certain things that are tough for me to do, like being rejected or having conversations or these things. And I, I done a couple episodes on the idea of, of giving yourself points 
Like if you're ever rejected, you give yourself a point and you get enough, you cash it in for confidence. Like it's a teddy bear at a state fair or something like that. Like confidence comes from disappointment and rejection and, and these yeah. things and awkwardness. Um, same with other areas of life, disappointment and, and so on and so forth. So we could prove to ourselves that we're always bringing things with us. So that's why I'm very passionate about the idea of evolving and changing. And it comes from your mindset. It comes from what you're willing to accept. It comes from your, your challenging, your aversion to be honest with yourself and with other people. And that's all mindfulness is. And I think we're all fully capable of doing it and um, applying it in every area of life, dating, career, you know, health, whatever it may be. Uh, it's a gift. 100%. I mean, I was talking to my friend this morning. I was like, if you had seen me five years ago, you wouldn't recognize me. I was like, I don't, yeah. even sometimes when I see some of like my journal, I found my old journal from when my ex and I broke up in 2018 cool. when yeah. I was like a shell of a human and it, it was hard for me to read it. But I think what some people don't realize is like case you and I both started at nothing. We both started over. We had careers, we had lives, and then we started this. And so people can come and say, oh, but look at the success you've had. It's like, and I started with zero followers. I started with literally an idea, rock bottom going, all right, here we go. And it's like, and to your point, I didn't start with nothing. I came with all of this experience that has thus bred into an entirely new story. And I wish that if people, anybody that's out there listening right now, if you are at a point where like you're fucking rock bottom, you've just lost everything. You are, you are feeling discouraged. You are feeling all that now more than ever is where you need to start to feel the confidence within yourself that you can make it through. Because I promise you when you get squeezed to the point at to no return, that is where you bounce right back up and you can start an entirely new chapter from, I always said like from the Phoenix rising, it's like from those ashes comes an even stronger, more beautiful version of who you are. Because to your point case, you don't start from zero, you start with experience and that's invaluable. So I'm just so grateful. Thank Amen. you so much. Amen. Thank you so much for being on Do The Work. It was so awesome to have you. Where can people find you? Of course. Well, thank you for having me. And any chance to, to jam on these topics is one that yeah. I, I love to do. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's case.kenny on Instagram, cool. New Mindset Who Dis podcast, and newmindsethudis.com for any books or journals. Um, that's, again, journaling, I think, is something that's so powerful, especially if you're like a little averse to therapy or you haven't found the right therapist. Yeah. Journal, see what it see what it brings your life. It'll, it'll definitely bring you something. Awesome. And now I will, I will link everything in the show notes. So don't worry to anybody. If you can't find it, you can click and follow, but case, thank you again so much. And it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you.